Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And it is a hot one out there. We are recording about the end of July and um, the temperatures match the season. So it is, is a scorcher out there. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about growing in containers. So if you do that now, you've probably noticed it's a bit more work in the summer heat. Um, and to help us out, we have our co-host with us every single week. We have Ken Johnson, horticulture educator in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. It's definitely warm and sunny out. It's not good for redheads. That's true. I know. <laughs> and I know Katie Parker, our other co-host, who's usually here, is sweating it out at the Adams County Fair. And so I just, I hope they stay cool there because it's hot. Drink lots of water. Lots of water. Uh, redheads like Ken and the sunscreen. <laughs> sunscreen and shade. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Well, Ken, today we're talking containers. And so I want to ask, I know over the, the last couple of years, we've talked about what we do at our own home and gardens. I know you have some pretty interesting containers, but I'm curious, are you growing edible plants like vegetables, herbs, and ornamental plants like flowers, or do you just do one or the other? What do you prefer? We do both, um, primarily ornamentals. But we've got a, we've got um, some potatoes mm -hmm. that are growing in pots, and we've got uh, some blueberry plants and raspberries that are kind of bred for pots for container growing in pots as mm -hmm. well. So, how about you? Well, that uh, well for the most part, I in the past when we had a smaller house or we had a very small backyard, um, it was mostly container vegetables. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And that has kind of followed us along to our new place where we have a bit more room, but I have a few more vegetables in the ground, but I still grow a lot in containers for vegetables. But for the most part on my like deck and kind of in the front part of our house, it's all flowering plants. And, uh, we have a couple, uh, uh let's see, uh, mixed containers, but also I like just putting like a single plant in one container, say like one coleus and just let that go. I don't, I don't mix and match too much. Do you, do you guys mix and match, put different things in a container? Um, sometimes if we have leftovers, <laughs> when there's leftover it gets thrown in a pot, but yeah, yeah I'm not, I'm not very creative. I just kind of, <laughs> it's one and done usually. That's why I'm the same way though. I'm not creative. So I just put one plant in a container and I'm just like, if I don't like it, I, I arrange different containers together in groups and I can move and, and I can uh, edit as I will. So, yes. Um, so do you have a, a unique type of a plant that you grow in a container or something fun that you enjoy? Well, we've got, uh, let me think, like six or seven plumeria trees. Um, so those are, um, one of the, the flowers they use to make lays out of mm. uh, and stuff. So they're a tropical. Uh, we got those when we lived in Florida. Um, but you could grow those outside year round or only bring them in <laughs> once in a while. And some of those are getting to be oh, eight, nine feet tall. So we're going to have a decision to make here in a few years because our ceilings oh, no. are 10 foot. So <laughs> we're going to over one of those. Um, usually every um, year for Christmas, kids give me some kind of tropical fruit so um we've got dragon fruit which is a, a cactus you can find those the kind of red fruit that looks kind of like a dragon egg mm -hmm. um in stores we've got one of those um and that thing is crazy it puts on a lot of growth um another one i'm not sure what we're going to do with them if start bringing it inside <laughs> uh we've got some citrus trees we've got a lime tree uh, an australian finger lime we've got uh, some vanilla vine or orchid um, mm -hmm. miracle fruit which is that fruit that when you eat it makes everything that sour taste sweet so you eat a fruit and then bite into a lemon it tastes like lemonade um, have one of those I'm probably forgetting one or two but those are the ones that come to mind you've totally blown me out of the water Ken I have <laughs> nothing like that that's like I have marigolds and uh, <laughs> maybe some petunias um, I actually, I did uh, get one uh, from my mom this year. She bought this plant and she brought it to me. It's called curry plant, uh, C-U-R-R-Y. And it has a gray pubescence. It's a small, very fine textured leaf. 
I don't, it, it's not related to like turmeric or anything like that. It's a different thing, but I think it has the common name that it has. I don't know the scientific name, I'm sorry. But when you brush the foliage, it smells like curry powder. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty neat. I don't know if you heard of that one, but it's, it's a fun one. You know, we've got, so we have a coffee tree that's small. Mm -hmm. um, my wife likes tea, so we got, kids and I got her a tea plant for Christmas this year, so. So the, the plumeria, is yes. that, does that flower each year? Can you get it to flower in our neck of the woods? So yeah, I've, we've, it, at least one of our trees has bloomed every year for the last four or five years. Um, a lot of times they, they kind of start putting on their, the flower buds in the fall. Mm -hmm. And then we bring them in and they go dormant during the winter. So they drop all their leaves and stuff. Um, and then when we bring them out in the spring, we'll kind of resume growth and start flowering. So we've got two pretty big flower clusters right now on there and they smell amazing. So mm -hmm. I, can, I can take some pictures and we can show that for those on YouTube. Perfect. Yeah. If you're watching us on YouTube, we can uh, edit in some photos here of what we're talking about. If you're listening to us on your uh, you know, podcast platform, uh, just uh, use your best imagination or you can click the link in the description below. That'll take you to the YouTube yes, channel. Use your Google skills. <laughs> That's right. Use the old Google. Um, okay, Ken. Well, I was going to ask you this later, but now we're kind of on the topic. I, I wanted to get any, um, is there anything special you do, say for those plumeria trees? They're woody, right? They're like, as the name implies. So do you have to prune them? Anything special? Um, <laughs> we're kind of getting to the point we probably should. Um, mm -hmm. we don't, we just bring it, we haul them in and out, um, in the, in the fall when it starts getting cold. Um, usually when the temperatures start getting um, down in the fifties at night, we'll start bringing them in because they can't tolerate really any kind of cold temperatures. Um, we do repot them every few years. We need to do that pretty soon. Um, you know, some of the, they've been in those pots for a couple of years now. And a lot of that potting soil is kind of settled and, and been used up and have quite a few circling roots that you can see in there. So I'm going to have to do some surgery probably next spring on um, those. And the pots are falling apart because these are eight, nine foot trees and little pots and they get blown over and pots break. So and we're using plastic pots just because I can't imagine trying to haul in a ceramic pot that oh, big. Yeah. be a nightmare. Yeah. I have, um, I have helped my, so my mom has kind of a plant collection as, as you described that we haul in every fall and we haul out every spring and she's got these pot movers um, that she can wrap around them. And that, that's what we move or use to move them. And you kind of have to like bear hug the pot to grab the, the handles of this pot mover. And I do remember one time we were moving a container out of the house and I'm bending over and I'm walking up the steps, coming out the door, and I look face to face. Uh, there's a black rat snake circled around the inside of the pot. And it must have come in in the fall, and we brought it out in the spring. And But no mice that winter. So you probably didn't have many mice. Don't nope. worry about it. Nope. And the mouse, or not the mouse, the rat snake had little bumps in its body. So you could tell it's been eating well. Oh, yeah. This yeah, does much better. Thing. That's right. They are a good thing. It does a better job than cats, I'll tell you. Okay, so um, we, we talked about some of the fun things that we've grown, but what are let's get into the basics of container growing and gardening, because where we're at right now, we're in the just, it's 90 some degrees outside as we're recording this. And yeah, I, I'm having to do a lot of maintenance with containers, but I think a lot of this maintenance kind of stems from how we've initially set them up and what we've used. And so uh, Ken, first things first, what do we use to fill our containers with? What do we plant our plants in? So should be using a, a potting mix. You don't want to use garden soil. Those are going to be too heavy. They kind of, especially around here in central Illinois, um, they would just retain too much moisture. They're going to have weed seeds in there more than likely. There's going to be diseases and insects too. So, you know, just your regular soil is not a good idea. You want the potting mix. Usually that's going to be a peat-based um, or it's a little more and more uh, coconut core based. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to retain some moisture, but it's going to drain fairly well. Um, and those don't have um, a tremendous amount of nutrients in them. So a lot of times those will come with a slow release fertilizer uh, mixed in there. Um, they'll also have perlite, <clears throat> which is that white stuff. Um, 
we'll Google rocks. Um, some will have vermiculite, um, some other things. I know for our citrus and our plumeria, we do more of a kind of a citrus mix, which has more sand in it um, compared to your typical potting mix. Mm -hmm. um, or cactus mix, kind of the same thing. So some of you, some of your plants, you can get a little more specialized potting mixes depending on on what you're growing and stuff as well. You know, for our our blueberries that we're growing, ours we want a lot, a lot of peat in there. Um, try to get a little more acidic and stuff and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I I've had kind of people argue both ways of this, but in terms of specialized mixes, when people are growing things like succulents. I have typically cautioned folks away from that, what you see at the, um, you know, larger retailer stores, they call them succulent potting soil. Um, those tend to be a pretty heavy peat base mix. Uh, I, I, I have used for years now, it's more of a rock based mix for my succulents and they seem to do far better in that um, than more of that peat based mix. And so, as you said, you can get these really specialized potting soil mixes depending on what plants you plan on putting in that container yeah and you can buy the individual components mm -hmm. um, fairly easily you can go buy bags of peat moss bags of perlite vermiculite um, if i do sand i usually just get kind of the playground sand and and wash and rinse it really well to make sure there's any of the salts and stuff um because we've got, got got some carnivorous plants too so make sure i get all that that extra stuff out of there yeah yeah and Another issue sometimes folks have, have mentioned when I'm doing like a, talking about containers, they ask about mining peat in the peat bogs. And I would say most of our peat, is this right, Ken, comes from Canada? Is that where we source most of that? Yeah, at least that's what the bags say. Yeah, it's got the Canadian flag <laughs> on it. So we think that's where it comes from. Um, and and I, I, did, I did a little bit more digging on this and our, it does take a, many, many years, you know, probably hundreds or so years for a peat bog to, uh, for, you know, for that to establish, to create that peat and build up that layer of material. Um, and in terms of kind of the, the harvest and sustainability, based on what I've, I've, I've read and, and learned that Canada does a, a far better job than other countries out there. And so they, they kind of see that as this is a valuable resource and they're trying to preserve it as best they can. Yeah, I think it's one reason you're starting to see more of the core based Mm -hmm. um, stuff, especially with your seed starting mixes, um, seeing those a lot more. Um, and I think and a lot of people use um, compost as well as kind of their, their main organic matter instead of peat. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, and I, I, I would say the biggest benefit, well, for the human is just how lightweight it makes the container. Um, I like to move my containers. I don't always put them in the right spot in the spring and then I got to find the right spot. And so being lightweight really helps. Um, but I, another way that I've compared why we use soil free mix versus just dirt from the ground, soil from the ground is there's no way that we can replicate what's happening in the soil in terms of just the sheer volume. Water can move around, it can move away from the roots. And so there's a lot of volume there. We don't have that in a container, so we need to be able to move the water away from the roots so it's not just sitting there up against the roots, which could create root rot issues. And, and Ken, you had mentioned this all before. And so I'm just I'm just explaining things twice, you know. <laughs> it means it's important. <laughs> That's right. It's important. And and so if you go to the garden center and you pick up a bag of potting soil and it's really, really heavy, I would say that is the time. I, I've seen this where they, it's actual, like they've mixed in actual soil or garden soil in with some of that soil free mix. It's really heavy. Um, the, the potting soil or potting mix, um, the soil free mix, that stuff is very lightweight and they even compress it into bales and bags. And so, yeah, it is a little bit heavy, but for the volume you're getting, it's pretty lightweight when you compare it. Yeah. And don't call it soil. The soil people will get angry at you. That's right. There's it's no not really soil. Sand, silt, and clay. <laughs> <laughs> I said dirt earlier, so I hope no real soil people. That's, that's even worse. <laughs> that's, I know. I know. <laughs> oh, goodness. So uh, next up, Ken, is how do we select our containers? Um, so let's talk first about materials. What, what options do we have when we're trying to pick out a container? Um, so when you go to, if you go to kind of your typical garden center, more than likely there's going to be your plastic um, 
they'll be ceramic, um, terracotta or glazed. Um, and at least around here, I'm seeing a little bit more of the, the fiberglass um, pots, which are, which I kind of like because they're, they're stronger than the plastic, but they're still lightweight. They're not <clears throat> really heavy, like some of those ceramic mm -hmm. um, can get, and you can leave those outside, whereas your, your ceramics is probably not the best idea because you get water in there and that expands in the winter especially with terracotta that'll start breaking on you yeah i i have made that mistake many times and accident you, you think you can push it in the fall you're like okay just a few more weeks maybe i got some like cool season greens growing in my uh, terracotta pots um and that darn hard freeze comes before i even know it <laughs> it cracks the pot <laughs> Oh yeah, because in fall, it never fails. I think in Illinois, that cold hard freeze comes in right after a rain shower, it seems like. And so that pot's full of water. And what does water do when it freezes? It expands and it cracks all of our pots. And that's that's my story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's also, I forgot to mention wood pots too, like your whiskey barrel mm -hmm. um, planters. And sometimes you can get kind of the wood, um, kind of wood box type planters, like orchids and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, hanging baskets type thing yeah and they have the coconut have, core mm -hmm. kind of the, the liners that you put in a metal basket as well uh just kind of an aside an interesting design idea um that i've done in the past is uh, we did mums in those coconut core line baskets and so we had mums on top but then we inserted plugs in the core into the potting soil and so it was actually just a big ball of mums Oh, if you ever want a hanging basket idea, that, that was a lot of fun to try. I've also heard of people taking those two halves and putting them together and yeah, just poking stuff Ooh. all the way through, all the way around. That would be fun. Uh, yes, you're a little like just ball of flowers. I love it. Um, do you have a preferred material that you like to use, Ken? You had mentioned plastic earlier in terms of weight um usually get plastic because i'm cheap mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're lightweight mm -hmm. um and they come in <clears throat> fairly big sizes um and that's that's primarily what we have uh, we've got some ceramic pots um that usually we'll put out front um by the front door and stuff that will look a little better than a brown or plastic pot um and some of the we've got a couple of fiberglass too um but at least around here they don't come really big um but if i could find some big ones i'd probably get fiberglass type for um purple areas and stuff because mm -hmm. a little bit stronger when those pots get blown over because they're so top heavy it'd be nice that they yeah. don't crack all the time yep and from like a design standpoint i had a garden designer say oh you better not put a colorful container out there because that detracts from the plants that you have in the container well I would argue that sometimes my plants in the container don't look that great. So I'd rather have like a bright blue or red or yellow uh, container out there because it's it's striking, I think, all year long, um, provided it can be out in the winter. If not, it should be moved inside. As can yeah, well, especially if you get some some color contrast with the blooms mm -hmm. and stuff. Exactly. But, so but I'm not a designer, garden designer. So. <laughs> yeah. Just putting you on notice, garden designer um, friend beloved friend so yes <laughs> um it, i have been using recently a lot of fabric pots containers i really like them uh and that's primarily what i grow my vegetables stuff in so i have right now i have tomatoes peppers um what else i used to grow ground cherries in them and then I grew ground cherries and I never have to plant them again because they come up everywhere by seed. So I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, and then some, maybe a bit more of unique crops is I have uh, turmeric and ginger growing in a, a bunch of fabric containers as well. And they, they do great, but they're like terracotta in that they dry out so quickly. So I have to be on them all the time with the water. So just be mindful of that if you do terracotta, fabric, some of these that dry out real quick. Yeah, we've... We've done we've done the the uh, fabric with potatoes. We did that for a couple of years just because it mm -hmm. makes them a little easier to harvest. And <clears throat> I may probably had too many potatoes in there. I probably should just put one seed piece instead of two or three. But yeah, I could not keep up with the water. Mm -hmm. We were watering twice a day, and they're still drying out. So yeah, we got <laughs> we kicked the fabric pots to the curb. And <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah. 
if ours, so our art, mine is kind of the pot itself is in the shadow of our deck and the plants just situated just right so that they're in the full sun. But for the most part, the containers are shaded. So that helps. Mulch on top helps. Um, they, like you mentioned, potatoes, they really prefer having a cooler root system. And in a container, that can be hard to achieve sometimes. It can get really hot. Um, so I found wood chips or just wood mulch kind of helps that helps at least insulate a little bit better. Yeah, this year we've I've mulched most of the, the pots we have. <clears throat> and I found that to work to help quite a bit with with watering. Sometimes I can get away with every other day, every two days mm -hmm. instead of, of daily watering. So Ken, the other day I had a friend contact me and I had gifted her a rubber tree. And I, I measured the existing container and it was really ugly. It was this gray plastic thing. It was cracked and falling apart. Um, and it's like, okay, you need to get a 14 inch container because that's what the existing one was. Or maybe you can go up one size because we always say don't, don't go up to like a 30 inch container because that's too much of a soil volume because your root system in that plant is adapted to that smaller size. So you have to slowly size it up uh, so that you don't overwhelm it with, with water. Um, anyway, she went to the store and she's like, nothing here is labeled as a 14 inch container. It's all in gallons. So Ken, how do we tell, <laughs> how can I tell her, uh, how, okay, how do I convert a 14 inch container to a gallon size? <laughs> that is a very good question. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Pot sizes is one thing I've always, <laughs> always struggled with because yeah, you, you know, your gallon, you're doing volume, but you're your 14 inch, I think they're usually measuring the, the diameter mm -hmm. um, of that pot. So it's not really taking into account how deep that is. Um, yes. So it's kind of almost an apples to oranges comparison there. Mm -hmm. um, so if that, in that situation, I would probably take a ruler with me and start measuring pots mm -hmm. or tape measure, borrow one from yes. the hardware department and measure <laughs> that goes <laughs> <it> back. <laughs> Just take it back when you're done. That works. Yeah, I. that's the only thing I could su suggest was, well, and you have to measure the opening to see what what you're getting and you know again try not to go way too much larger um and we don't necessarily do we want can we go smaller can we shave off root volume to squeeze it into a smaller container i i wouldn't personally but, but i suppose you could i don't know if that's the best i don't know yeah maybe if you wanted to bonsai it <laughs> that's right yes <laughs> some root pruning which then would translate to losing some above ground growth so yeah the other thing I did, I did send her, basically I went to a container wholesaler. <laughs> they had a chart and I was like, uh, this kind of helps you equate what, a, what the diameter is to the gallon size, the volume. But then they also just have containers that just have random letters and numbers on them. So I don't know what those are. I think it's probably if you're in the nursery trade, it all makes sense, but. <laughs> it does, it does. And I only pretend to be. Yes. I don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> so can potting soil can be expensive and I'm planting something in the container. Um, and we talked about how important drainage is. Uh, I can go to Google right now or Bing or your search engine of choice, type in improved drainage in containers and it will tell me to put rocks or gravel in the bottom of the container. So can I do that to save money on potting soil? and do better, give me better drainage? Um, you can do it. It's not gonna help you with your drainage though. I like so, how you answered that. <laughs> you can do anything you want. That's That's right. That'd be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can, you know, if you put those rocks in the bottom um, and there's videos you can, I'm sure you can find this online. You get a, mm -hmm. a perched water table. So the water will travel down through your potting mix. It hits that rock and it doesn't like transitioning from one media to another so it just kind of sits in that soil or that sort of potting mix um and just gets real saturated um and unless you get a kind of a tremendous amount in there then it'll start going through but a lot of times your pot it'll just sit in that that's that mix in your your potting mix is a lot more moist than it needs to be and can lead to root rot um, and stuff so and a lot of times you hear people put them in their tube um because they, they don't want the, the media falling out of the holes at the bottom mm -hmm. um you put a a coffee filter at the bottom or cut out some newspaper, put it on the bottom, just like a single layer, just enough to keep that stuff from falling through uh, the bottom. And then over time, the roots will go through that and kind of hold everything together. Um, so as that, that filter, that paper decomposes. 
you shouldn't have too many issues um, with the media coming out. And you should probably have a uh, um, a saucer underneath anyway. Mm -hmm. If you've got drainage holes, so your water's not getting in everywhere. Um, and that saucer could help hold some of that media that may fall out too. Yes. Now, I, I don't use saucers when my plants are outside and that is to the detriment of my wood deck. Um, that's not good for the wood deck. So just keep that in mind. It, it keeps the wood, it holds, like it stays more wet under there. And um, I probably need to do some sanding and resealing there. So um, saucers I think are important. Uh, the reason why I don't is because I can be lazy sometimes and I don't empty out the extra water and maybe I get mosquitoes. And so I, uh, I'm just trying to uh, check some tasks off my list here. So, uh, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm on the same boat and say, do as I say, not as I do type exactly. situation. <laughs> exactly. Because you do have to empty those saucers out if they fill up with water. So you don't want, again, your plant to be sitting in, in water. And, and also that, that's like, I, I found to be a wonderful breeding site for mosquitoes. It is. <laughs> So, so uh, at least what empty them out at least once a week. Exactly. As far as mosquitoes go. Probably more often if you've if you don't want your plants to be waterlogged. Yeah. Uh, so don't put rocks or gravel in the bottom of the pot. It doesn't help with drainage, as Ken mentioned. Um, and we really want to be giving our plants as much soil volume as possible. All right, Ken, for many years I have been of the uh, kind of similar with the saucers into my containers. I, I don't really want to have to work too hard at keeping my containers going. So I have omitted or just not even done any type of fertilizer. Uh, and uh, my plants have paid for it. We you get to about midsummer or late season and the containers, the plants in them look pretty bad. Um, stunted, maybe they're not flowering or fruiting as much. This year, I did a little experiment where I had just plain potting mix, planted a, uh, you know, about 50 marigolds in that. Then I had potting mix that I mixed in a slow release fertilizer and I planted 50 more marigolds. This, the difference, and I'll throw an image up there right now, the difference is staggering the growth levels of the two different, uh, uh, different treatments. Um, do you do fertilizer? Should we be doing fertilizer now? It's the end of July. Is it too late? What should we be doing? So usually the, the potting mix we buy, we usually get the stuff that has the slow release fertilizer already in it. Um, so don't typically have to do too much extra. Um, and that stuff is probably good for a year, kind of a growing season after that. If you're kind of using the same potting mix, it would be good to um, either mix some more of the slow release um, in there and you can buy just containers of the slow release. Uh, mix that in, put that into the soil, your growing media in the spring, or you can use a kind of a liquid or even another granule, just a quick release liquid or granular. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how much and how often is going to depend on the pot size and what you're growing and <laughs> all those other qualifiers. But just read the label. And I'll tell you how much to put on and how often you need to do it. But yeah, this time of year, if you haven't had any fertilizer in your pots, would probably be a good idea. Um, because most of the, like your, your peat moss and your coconut gourd don't necessarily have a lot of nutrients in them. They're kind of a nutrient poor media. So providing some of that supplemental um, nutrition, that fertilizer is going to help a lot with your plants. Mm -hmm. And we still potentially have at least two months worth of growing ahead of us, if not a two and a half months, depending on when our first frost happens. Yeah, I'd say it's, I'd say especially important if you're trying to grow vegetables. If you're growing tomatoes, peppers, anything that's going to be fruiting, um, having some adequate levels of, of nutrients in there is going to be important. Yeah. I, I will um, add, tack on to my story. So now that I did those two treatments, non-fertilizer compared to like a slow release mixed in. So now being this late in the season, I'm not going to take the time to mix in a, a slow release into those existing containers. As you mentioned, Ken, I am just going to do some type of a, a quick release, some type of a foliar uh, fertilizer that's just going to get watered into the container. It's quick. It doesn't stick around very long, but it gives them a little boost if you need to do something like that. And in terms of synthetic versus organic, the shelves of your garden center are full of both options there. So you have many things to choose from. 
And I would, I would say for most of your, your more quick release, especially if it's a liquid, it's probably every two weeks. Um, you'd probably want to put that on again, again, depending on, on what that product says. But mm -hmm. it's, it's probably not going to be a one and done with your liquid fertilizers. Yeah. Um, one thing that we have found, because we have used uh, fish emulsion before, um, if you have raccoon issues like we do in my house, they smell that and they think you have buried fish in your containers and they will just tear up the containers looking for that. So it's a, it's a word of caution. Uh, fish emulsion works good. It can grow really healthy, good plants and also draw in some raccoons. So I need to keep the dog tied up out there or something. And hey, don't put that on your sweet corn. Oh no, they don't need any more incentive for that. <laughs> Well, Ken, finally, as, as we are, are battling the heat and hunker down in the air conditioning, our containers maybe aren't at, that lucky. So I am out watering at least once a day. Um, so I've watered my containers this morning when I got up. Uh, I will go home tonight and I'm going to check. And I have had instances where some of the containers that are more full sun or maybe more on the edge of, say, a group of containers, those are dried out already. So they get a second watering in the evening. Um, do you have a watering technique, tips for your cup, your pots? Um, stick your finger in there if it's dry water. Mm -hmm. That's basically uh, what we do. Or if the kids start fighting and arguing, ask them who wants to go water plants. And mm -hmm. then they go take their fight outside of who's going <laughs> to water and so-and-so spraying me and, and whatnot. But yeah, usually yeah, it's a lot of times it's once a day for us. Um, Every once in a while, we can get away with every other day, depending on on the size of the pot and the plant. You know, smaller pots with big plants are going to definitely need more water than some of your pots that are a little bit bigger with with plants that are a little more appropriately sized for that mm -hmm. pot. I've found that my uh, angel's trumpet tree and our lemon tree suck up water much quicker than any other container that we have out there. Uh, and yeah, I am. I, if I don't water those every day, the plant wilts and I worry might die. So I have to be very vigilant with those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's in the past I've grown tomatoes in pots and <laughs> grown indeterminate yeah. tomatoes in pots. I do and that still. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes you almost have to just leave the hose on all day, <laughs> it seems mm -hmm. like, to keep them well watered. Yeah. I've seen the indeterminates and in pots grows up over the fence, over the fence, down to the neighbor's yard, and the neighbor now has tomatoes. So, yeah, just got to keep watering them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! I, another thing that I will add, you know, be, before we we finish up, is the University Building Extension. We do have a website. Um, if we haven't answered your questions, uh, you can check out uh, successful container gardening. Uh, I can leave a link below in the description here. Uh, if you do have other container questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Again, our contact information is, uh, is below uh, and we can read your question on air or not. We'll just answer via email, whatever. We're here to answer questions. That's what we do. So it feels like, yeah, in the, the throes of summer, Ken, is that's, that's all I'm doing right now. You can always tell when it's been a nice weekend because there are usually quite a, fit, quite a few more questions on Monday than normal. <clears throat> That's true. That's true. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, the Good Growing Podcast uh, is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by me, Chris Enroth. A uh, special thanks uh, and a, a, a salute goes to Katie Parker out uh, sweating away at the Adams County Fair, uh, probably judging uh, every single uh, project out there. So thank you, Katie, for doing what you do uh, in service to our 4-H uh, youth. And Ken, good to see you today here in the air conditioning. You too. Go water those pots. I know. I need So in, in that vein, I have to go water plants. So after you're done watering your pots, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. I will go water my pots. And then next week, we are going to be sitting down uh, with us and Katie with us again. And we're going to be talking sweet corn that will be a fun topic because i absolutely love sweet corn and it is literally coming out of our ears right now so sweet corn is is heart being harvested and picked it's nothing better than fresh locally grown sweet corn. well listeners thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening or if you're watching this on youtube watching and as always keep on growing